from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. From the farm to the fire, there's no fingerprint in the environment. It goes away. We give you an exclusive look at a new firefighting product made out of soy. Cattle markets hit record highs as a new USDA report turns bearish. While dairy producers in the Southern Plains continue to battle against a mystery illness. Every dairy farmer knows that a cow that doesn't eat is at risk to get uh, other syndromes and other diseases. The latest developments right now on Ag Day. Ag Day, presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when the name on the cap matches the power of one's purpose. Pioneer, what's next happens here. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. We begin this morning with breaking news. USDA releasing new information about that mysterious illness we've been telling you about. The American Association of Bovine Practitioners reporting illnesses impacting dairy cattle in Kansas, New Mexico, and most of all, Texas, and now we know what's causing it. APHIS reporting that the mystery illness has been identified as a strain of highly pathogenic avian influenza, or bird flu, the same illness that has impacted wild birds and poultry across the country. To date, three dairies in Texas and one in Kansas have tested positive for HPAI, but no mention about New Mexico. Now it's reported the illness has been impacting cattle since early February. The issue covering nearly 10% of the animals, causing reduced feed consumption and a 10 to 20% decline in milk production. A Texas dairy farmer told us the mystery illness acts similar to the flu and seems to target only older cows. As the industry works to uncover all of the factors causing the disease, one veterinarian says what makes pinpointing the cause so difficult is trying to decipher what the main symptoms of the illness are versus the secondary symptoms and related issues. It's not a pneumonia outbreak as far as we can see. It's not a mastitis outbreak. I think that some of those things that we're seeing on farms are probably secondary to the initial agent that's causing cows to go off feed. And every dairy farmer knows that a cow that doesn't eat is at risk to get uh, other syndromes and other diseases. And so I think that's what's uh, that's what's occurring right now. Now, clinical signs include a sudden drop in milk production. Some severely impacted cows are producing thicker, more concentrated colostrum-like milk. The problem causes a drop in feed consumption with a simultaneous drop in rumen function accompanied by loose feces and some fever. Now, Texas Ag Commissioner Sid Miller saying there is no threat to the public and there will be no supply shortages. He says no contaminated milk is known to have entered the food chain and that it was all dumped. You can check out dairyherd.com for more on this developing story. And another health concern, this time when it comes to goats. Minnesota reporting a juvenile goat tested positive for highly pathogenic avian influenza. This is the first identified case of it in domestic livestock here in the U.S. It's reported the goat lived on a farm in Stevens County in the same area where a poultry flock tested positive for the illness late last month, sharing the same pasture and sole water source. The case is still under investigation, but experts at the University of Minnesota Extension are recommending producers check their biosecurity practices and not allow poultry, waterfowl, and wildlife to share water sources or feed. Another developing story we're following, the cattle market has broken another record when it comes to prices on Friday. The North led the way with sales reaching as high as $191 per hundredweight for live cattle. The record hit ahead of a new bearish cattle on feed report. Now, USDA putting the number of cattle and calves on feed at 11.8 million head on March 1st. That's up 1% from the previous year. Placements came in at 1.89 million head, seen in red on this chart. That's up 10% and the highest for February since the series began back in 1996. Now, the placement number coming as a surprise to many. In January, we actually had a relatively low placement number. Uh, that was due to the winter storms that we had across the Midwest that, that came in early January, which delayed some of those placements. So uh, some of the increase uh, that we saw in placements during February was the fact that uh, we were making up for some of the weather incidents that occurred during January. 
As for those feeder cattle prices, they're about a third higher than this time a year ago. So how long could we see these higher cattle prices? We talked with economists about it as part of the Farm Journal Ag Economist Monthly Monitor. This month, Monthly Monitor jumped another $3 per hundredweight. Even if we started herd expansion this year out of, let's say, a calf that was born this spring, uh, that calf uh, is held back into the herd. She's not going to have her first calf for two years. And it's another 18 months before that animal is at their finished weight and becomes beef. And so that's almost four years if we started aggressively expanding today. Anderson says that means it could be 2028 or even 2029 before we start seeing rapidly expanding beef supplies, a sign that elevated cattle prices could be in for a long ride if demand can hold. The winter weather isn't over just yet. A powerful winter storm is bringing widespread disruption to the Central Plains and Midwest. Millions are impacted. The National Weather Service cautioning that travel may be difficult in areas due to icy roads and whiteout conditions. There were blizzard warnings to start the week in parts of northern Colorado, Kansas, and north up to Minnesota, Nebraska, and South Dakota. And that system is expected to continue through the Midwest and Great Lakes today before traveling northeast where homes and businesses are already dealing with significant snowfall from the weekend. Meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht joins us with an update. Yeah, strong low pressure system, a corresponding cold front to coming through parts of the, the south and the Midwest could spark some severe weather back in the deep south coming up for Tuesday morning and Tuesday afternoon, starting to wrap up into the evening hours, much like this low pressure system. Now, as we talked about last week, we got this low pressure system moving through and a trough moving off to the east, which means a ridge of high pressure is going to try to build in behind this system, setting us up for now, a bit of a, a quiet pattern Thursday, Friday, a little bit into Saturday, and then as we turn our attention towards Easter, may get some more rain back in the forecast. But you see a little bump in these lines right here. That is the ridge starting to develop back across the plains as well as a little bit into the Midwest with that deep trough still hanging on. This is Thursday at 9 p.m off on the East Coast. So it is going to take some time to work through these systems. Another bit of energy off here on the West Coast. We'll talk more about that and your overall pattern coming up in just a bit. And what a sweet picture. This one coming in from Oklahoma. Everyone loves those calf kisses. <laughs> I'm bored. Your forecast coming up. Happening this week, the trial is underway for an Arizona rancher accused of shooting and killing a migrant from Nogales, Mexico on his ranch. Now, we've been keeping you updated on the case involving 75-year-old George Allen Kelly. He's charged with second-degree murder in the death of 48-year-old Gabriel Cuen Butimia in January of last year. Investigators say Kelly shot at a group of unarmed migrants who were walking through his cattle ranch in the Kino Springs area. Kelly's attorney says he shot into the air above the migrants because he feared for his safety. They also contend Kelly saw five men walking through his ranch while he was inside his home and that they were carrying large backpacks and rifles and that's when he heard a single shot fired. Now Kelly earlier rejected a plea offer of negligent homicide in the case, the case becoming a hot point in the politically charged debate surrounding border security. Prima Wawona was once the largest stone fruit grower in the country, covering more than 13,000 acres. Now only 1,300 acres remain on the market. Our news gathering partners over at the Packer reporting two growers, Sun Pacific and Moonlight, have formed a joint partnership to buy up 5,000 acres of farmland that used to belong to Prima Wawona. The land purchase is valued at $91 million. Now the plan is to keep a majority of the acres in tree fruits. As we told you earlier this year, the Fresno, California-based operation filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy back in October, reporting more than $600 million in debt. Now, live cattle futures taking a breather on Monday, but soybeans saw some strength to start the week. We'll have details next. And later, building new market demand for soybeans. We're off to Georgia for an exclusive look at a brand new product ready to help fight fires. What it means for soybean farmers and consumer safety in the country.
Ag Day is brought to you by Germinator Closing Wheels. Germinator Steel Closing Wheels provides a 13 bushel advantage per acre in no-till and a 7 bushel advantage per acre in conventional. Do you have enough room in your bin to switch to the Germinator? Soybeans making some solid gains to start the week. Ag Day's Michelle Rook joins us with more in Markets Now. A mixed day on Monday in green and livestock futures. John Payne is back with us. And John, let's talk about the green complex. Soybeans had a nice up day. How much of that was short covering versus just this big rally we've been seeing in soybean oil? Well, I think bean oil is the driver here. And not just the soybean sector, it's uh, the edible oils in general. We saw canola up today. Rapeseed in Europe has been doing very well. Palm oil, uh, although it's corrected, it's kind of coming back higher again. Uh, which is all supported for the soybean sector. And I hate to oversimplify it and say, hey, just look at oil. But I think if you say we're at 52 cent oil, 53 cent oil, I make the case we could be closer to $13 beans. Uh, if you're down here at uh, you know where we were at 44, I, I would say you're probably closer to 11. So uh, that would be a big decider here as we move into the you know more volatile time of the growing season. This next quarter uh, is going to be, you know, it's – full of innuendo. It's full of emotion. And I think the market's getting ready for it here at the end of the quarter with, with folks covering shorts. No doubt. And because we had some kind of quiet trade in corn and wheat, you mentioned end of the quarter, that was probably part of it. Plus gearing up for the reports here on Thursday, right? I think you're seeing folks try to kind of get gunpowder off the side and, and either see how the rapport was or, you know, probably buy some premium ahead of it. I think you'll see volatility costs go up. So as the week goes on, I would say you're you're going to you're going to pay more and more for options if you're going to do something short term. Um, so you know you might as well do them uh, when the when the direction is your way. Uh, but for me, I, you know, no recommendations here. But my my hedges would always be downside on corn. You know, the 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 intentions for the farmers here isn't always coming through with the USDA realities, and I think they're going to show acres you know closer to 92, 93, uh, which would you know maybe eliminate with a bearish report take us down into that you know, low, you know, middle of fours again. And that's worst case scenario for me. I wouldn't be prepared for it. And cattle down on Monday with some triple digit losses working in the bearish cattle and feed report. Do you think we have to correct more though? Watch beef here. If you're bullish, I think you look at the margin trade. Margins have opened up are more, you know, friendly now with uh, with live lower. And, uh, you know, you look at where, uh, you know, the speculators are and they're really not fully in it. So I think if you want to be bullish, that's that's really your smoke. And, uh, you know, you look to try to buy breaks here, uh, given the time of the year. Thanks for joining us, uh, John Payne. That is Markets Now. And for more market analysis, put our Markets Now podcast. Severe storm risk increasing coming up for our Tuesday and possibility is there for several severe storms in portions of the deep south. That does include parts of Louisiana up and down the Mississippi with a potential for some stronger storms back up here towards the north and to the northwest. So again, a few tornadoes not out of the question. Damaging winds, heavy rain and large hail. Now this entire system is going to be working to the east and we lose the severe weather threat coming up for our Wednesday across a good portion of the United States. That's a severe weather threat. In terms of precipitation estimate, you know, where we're going to see a lot of that rain, it's going to start back here and move to the east. And as that low pressure system that we talked about ramps up and digs deeper across the United States and opens up this Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic moisture, are looking at a lot of rainfall coming through. Now, this is through Thursday night at 7 p.m. So remember, we were looking at that trough a little bit ago, the digging and bringing in a lot of that moisture, significant rainfall uh, through the southeast and also back up here to the north, even into New York City, where they're looking at nearly two inches of rainfall. Ridge of high pressure back here towards the east or the west is going to keep things relatively quiet. Just some light showers and maybe a rumble of thunder as the system exits. Maybe we get some snow on the other side of the system as well. So what this looks like uh, from the jet stream perspective, this is Tuesday, Wednesday and into Thursday. This is going to be your parent trough. That is going to bring the uh, some uh, substantial rainfall to the East Coast deep in the work week right now uh, under the influences of a ridge by Wednesday and Thursday that trough again starts to sink down here to the south with the blue with the ridge high pressure building back in and across the United States. Now in terms of Easter Saturday Sunday and a little bit into Monday things remain relatively quiet. That is going to be our next clipper system that will be moving through the Dakotas into next week. 
Start off with Arizona. We've got some evening showers high around 55 degrees, low of 36. What about Michigan? High about 57 degrees with some rain, low of 31. And Nebraska Adams, partly cloudy with some wind, high of 35 degrees. An agricultural overtime law may not be working as intended in California. We'll have details next. And later, as renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel come online, soybean meal stocks are expected to surge. We'll look at a new use for soy meal that may also save some lives in the country. A California state lawmaker is trying to pull back current overtime rules in the state. Republican Assemblyman James Gallagher of Yuba City argues a 2016 law didn't account for the realities of the ag industry and that it's hurting both farmers and their employees. The current law mandates overtime for farm workers working more than eight and a half hours a day or 45 hours in a week. California started phasing in the overtime law back in 2019. Now, one study conducted by researchers at the University of California concluded that the state's farm workers actually earned less money as overtime reform efforts were phased in. Small dairy farms in Oregon are celebrating a state policy change. The state's Department of Agriculture announcing it's withdrawing a decision that would have required smaller dairies to apply for a permit that's usually intended for large commercial farms. The Oregon Department of Ag reinterpreting its definition of a confined animal feeding operation or CAFO back in January 2023 to add smaller dairy farms in the policy. Now the change would have required those smaller dairies to install drainage systems along with putting in wastewater holding tanks, keeping daily records and pay fees. The agency says it is withdrawing its policy that the act of milking an animal in a barn or the washing of equipment used in milking an animal triggers a CAFO permit coverage requirement. It comes after a lawsuit was filed by four small dairy operators in an effort to stop enforcement. The decision was withdrawn effective immediately. Water isn't always the only option for fighting fires. Up next, how soybeans may be the right choice as farmers share the latest innovative use from Georgia, an exclusive look next in the country. Since the 1950s, fire departments across the country have used PFAS to put out fires. But the United Soybean Board has announced a greener alternative made from soybeans. Ag Day's Michelle Rook was in Dalton, Georgia to see the product unveiled and has this exclusive look. A new soy based fire suppressant has hit commercialization scale and it's due in part to research funded by U.S. soybean farmers. Cross Plain Solutions developed soy foam, the first and only soy based firefighting foam. It is a safer product than anything that's out on the market right now. Uh, we've just been certified uh, green screen gold certification. That's because soy foam is free of PFAS or forever chemicals with no detectable fluorines found in conventional fire suppressants. This, this replaces uh, the chemical, harmful chemicals that are in the, in the, the foams that are they're being used now. So it's, it's uh, really uh, biodegradable. It's not harmful to animal, humans or anyone. Dave Garley worked in the lab to help develop soy foam, which is 84% bio base. Something that's more environmentally friendly, that's healthier and safer for use. And then after point of use, it's rapidly degradable. There's no fingerprint in the environment. It goes away. Even though the product is growing, it's price competitive with conventional firefighting foams. Right now, based on what the market is, we see that we're uh, comparable in price and in some places even cheaper. It's also a sustainable solution as it's made from 50% soybean meal or flour. A new use and market opportunity needed for the extra meal that will come with soy processing expansion. A lot of the oil stock is going for renewable and biofuels and so we're getting a lot of meal that's, that's not being used. So any place where we can use meal and we can use it domestically, that's a huge shot in the arm for us. And through the soy checkoff, soybean farmers funded research and extensive testing for soy foam. Because it is a new new product that we can use with soybean meal. And uh, that's, that's one thing the United Soybean Board has really started to focus on is how do we start to make new products out of soybean meal that we're going to have uh, more of in the future. Because 
uh, you know, there's only so much, so many animals that we can feed it to. Premier polymers in Dalton, Georgia, will be manufacturing soy foam and say they're seeing an industry shift towards bio-based products. We see this push to, to get away from PFAS and, and so we're, we're eager to, to be involved in anything that, that uh, separates us from that. Soy foam, a new use from farm to fire. In Dalton, Georgia, I'm Michelle Rook reporting for Ag Day. All right, thanks, Michelle, and she'll have more on this exclusive look at this new product tomorrow morning. And that's all the time we have this morning. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day out in farm country.